I'm going to go through several link stories, and uh, I'm going to do it pretty quickly because I just want people to understand the headlines of each of these stories. Uh, because what I'm trying to get a sense is that, that there is a, a fair amount of knowledge that we've accumulated over the last four or five years that has now merged to where I do believe that we have a viable pathway to develop an intervention which can achieve, not a cure, I mean in the, in the current world, cure is being defined now as complete and total eradication of all HIV from a person, um, which is going to be a formidable challenge, as you can imagine. Uh, a much easier way to achieve um, a similar type of outcome is to develop these interventions that result in long-term control of the reservoir, if not its elimination. And we think this is going to be easier to achieve because it happens naturally in post-treatment control and elite control and so forth. So there is, there has been a, a and I've, I've talked about this in the past here, and I'm going to update it, a, uh, a series of stories in the HIV world and a series of stories in the oncology world, and they have merged into where I do think now it's actually, um, uh, we have these, uh, we have basically options that now can be tested. And as a consequence, we are about to launch a very robust family of linked clinical trials here in San Francisco. Um, which um, I'm hoping that your patients might be interested in participating in, um, that none of them by themselves are going to be curative, but the idea is in four or five years we combine all this stuff and maybe we can get good things to happen. So that's the plan, all right? And so I'm going to go through quickly, particularly the background. Um, here's some definitions uh, to, to keep in mind as we go through. When I talk about the reservoir, okay, I'm talking about the virus that can actually cause badness, all right? That's only about one in a hundred viruses that people have during long-term treatment. Most of the stuff uh, that people have in their cells is deleted, mutated, junk doesn't do anything. The reservoir re refers to that really small proportion of the virus that can actually replicate and cause rebound when you stop treatment. Um, and as I will go into in some detail, it is almost impossible nowadays to measure this particular reservoir. But that's what we're interested in. Latency. When I talk about latency, I'm talking about the fact that the virus can get into cells and then it becomes completely and totally silent, we think, um, and it hides there. The immune system can't get at it, and the only way actually for the immune system or anything else to get at it is to turn it on and push it out. That's latency. As I just mentioned, um, cure now is universally defined as complete total elimination of all the virus. Our group is not necessarily pursuing those types of interventions. We're not even sure it's possible. I don't even think it happened in Mr. Timothy Brown. Um, but a remission is, is certainly much more achievable, and here again we're using the oncology model, and the goal here is to be able to re do, re remove therapy and allow the virus to remain under control with limited risk for, for non-age morbidity or transmission for a long, long time, um, presumably years and years and years. And that's basically what we're going after. So before I get there, let me just um, uh, pose a few questions and some answers. A lot of this is background. What do we know about the size and the stability of the reservoir? Not much has changed in this regard. Um, we know that when you go on antiretroviral therapy, the amount of virus in the blood drops about five, six logs over a period of a few weeks, um, and that eventually people achieve a steady state level of viremia. So if you actually, um, you know, most people in the clinic right now on therapy have probably, if you look under the hood, have a viral load that's in the kind of the one to two copy range at most. Although if you notice, when you get back those um, viral load readings and it says um, um, uh, less than 40 but detected, that actually signifies that there's probably virus in those people at a level that's a bit higher than that one to two. Um, uh, I don't think anyone's ever quite figured it out, but there is persistent viremia in those patients. Um, uh, but people achieve a steady state in the amount of RNA that's in the blood. They also achieve a pretty much a steady state, we think, in terms of the overall size of the reservoir. It stays remarkably stable over many, many years. And of course, this is the fundamental problem. Um, a central issue to the stories I'm going to tell is the fact that the blood has not really given us a precise window into the tissues. The virus resides primarily in lymph nodes, probably the spleen, and almost certainly in a major way in the lining of the gut, where there is the own gut-associated immune system. Each of these tissue reservoirs have unique biologies that have a huge impact on how T cells act, 
and how the virus actually persists. And the virus that resides in them, according to some recent studies, is not necessarily the virus that we actually see in the blood. And this is a fundamental issue for us because we like to study blood when, in fact, probably what we need to be doing is studying tissues, and we're coming up ways to do that. Um, how does it persist? All right, there are basically three ways, there are three me mechanisms by which the, the reservoir persists indefinitely. The first and foremost, it's quite remarkable, um, is this concept that, that prior to antiretroviral drugs, the virus integrates into a cell, and that one cell that contains one HIV DNA will, over the period of many, many years during treatment, proliferate, proliferate billions and billions of times. Okay, and so then that's a massive expansion. It's almost like a cancer cell. You get a massive expansion of a single infected cell, and those types of populations, these clonally expanded cells, where one cell that's infected becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, is, uh, is in many patients the predominant mechanism by which the virus actually replicates. Um, and it's probably doing this because the virus is inserting itself into genes within CD4 T cells that control how the virus actually replicates um, and, and persists. It's very similar to the oncology model in terms of what happens when a cell turns from being a normal cell into one with malignant potential. It's these same genes often that are actually impacted, uh, leading to massive proliferation. So that's a major way for, for how HIV persists. Another one that's quite controversial, and to be honest, I think probably the more definitive study that was done was by Hiroi Otano a couple years ago uh, when she was working here with the SCOPE cohort. Uh, it's, it's in my mind, though there's a lot of controversy, at least in, particularly in people on protease inhibitors, uh, the virus is actually not completely shut down. It's persisting, it's replicating, primarily in tissues at a very low level. Um, and the degree to which this actually is happening in everybody is a very much a contentious issue with a lot of dogma, a lot of fighting, a lot of opinion, um, not a lot of fact. Uh, it's my personal opinion that the virus is probably spreading in lymph nodes um, to a certain extent. It's not a major cause of, of the size of the reservoir, however. Um, and there's an increasing series of studies, all from monkeys, um, that suggest that another way that the virus lives is that the virus actually um, finds itself living in these so-called B cell follicles. These are um, those places in the lymph nodes that are involved in making antibodies. The process of making antibodies is one in which you, um, uh, everything has to happen very carefully. And uh, CDAT cells, because they're these big massive killer cells that exclude all sorts of poisons, are not invited to that party. They are not allowed to access this part of the lymph node where antibodies are being made. Otherwise, they would screw things up. Um, and HIV sort of figured this out by luck, because there's a lot of CD4 T cells in those follicles. So the virus gets into the follicle, replicates like crazy, um, uh, um, but the CD8 C cells, the, the cells that are designed to actually keep it under control, can't get in. Um, and in monkey studies, it's been recently shown that if you if that if you break down that follicle, the amount of virus goes down. And if you take away CD8 T cells, even during treatment, the amount of virus goes up. So the function of CD8 T cells during treatment is also a major cause of persistence. So the three major causes are the clonal proliferation, that's 90% of it, um, a bad CD8 T cell response that it's dysfunctional, doesn't go where it needs to go, and an ongoing spread. So that's why the virus continues somewhat indefinitely. Do we know, this is just for, the, for this particular group here, because I know you guys are largely interested in, in how this stuff is having an impact on a day-to-day -day basis in the clinic. Um, and, and of course, I'm, I'm quite concerned about this as well. The question that um, people have only really danced around, haven't really fully figured out, is whether or not the virus that persists during treatment, primarily in tissues, primarily in the gut, have any clinical implications? Um, are they, is it harmful? Is it better to have a little bit of virus during treatment than a lot of virus? We haven't quite figured that out. Um, we know from the work of Peter Hunt in the room and others that a major mechanism by which people on treatment get in trouble is chronic inflammation. And Priscilla's group, Priscilla Shue's group, 
published this really nice paper. It's a little complicated um, that I think is somewhat relevant to this question. What she found out when she took people in the scope and options cohort and, and she did this high-end imaging with PET scans, and we're doing a fair amount of this, um, she found out that, that in treated HIV infection, uh, there is some evidence of chronic inflammation um, and that a big component of this chronic inflammation is can be observed in the lymph nodes where the virus is. It can also be observed in the blood vessels where we don't think there's much virus. But one can imagine, based on these first looks into what's happening systemically, that the virus factory that exists in lymph nodes, whether it's spreading or just being produced, is calling an inflammatory environment that is contributing either directly or indirectly to the chronic inflammation that we see in treated HIV infection, which indeed is then contributes to the excess amount of frailty, aging, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, neuropathy, dementia, liver disease, kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, and cancer, okay? All sorts of bad things can, in theory, uh, get its start um, from the lymph nodes. I think if you ask experts in the, in the room about this, is this a major player or a minor player? I think most would say this is probably a minor player, um, but it probably does contribute to a certain extent. So that would argue, actually, that we need to sort of figure out a way to dampen the virus, this reservoir, particularly in tissues, to see if that can enhance um, um, uh, immune function and so forth. And of course, we're working on that because anything that reduces the virus amount will contribute to a cure, but also can contribute to some of these chronic inflammatory conditions. Uh, I, I show this because Priscilla's group is doing a lot of these types of studies, and now Tim Hendricks' group is doing a lot of these types of studies, so you're going to hear about this. Um, these are studies in which we bring people in, we, we characterize them, we make sure that they're eligible, and then we send them over to the China Basin where they, they, they do these sort of high-end imaging studies that allows us to very carefully map out in the body um, um, where the inflammation is and perhaps even where the virus is. Can the virus, can the reservoir be measured? Um, uh, this is uh, probably not, um, but certainly uh, we can measure stuff, and we measure stuff all the time, and, and we certainly keep our virologists quite busy doing this stuff, but I got to tell you, I'm never quite sure what any of this means. Um, here's the fundamental problem, right? If you look, and I, I referred to this before, uh, the reservoir we care about is the virus that can replicate. It's the virus that actually, if you stop therapy, it shoots up. All right? That's the pink dot in the middle. The yellow dot is a reservoir. The yellow thing that surrounds it is, a, is the reservoir that um, could, in theory, replicate, but it doesn't seem to want to do so. It's actually sort of stuck there. It's hard to get it out. Um, it's somewhat frozen. Um, but we think it can contribute to replication under, under certain conditioning. And the big mass of blue stuff refers to, 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 to HIV that's basically defective, deleted, hypermutated, can't replicate. But, you know, so finding, finding the, so the, it's, a, it's a classic um, pin in the haystack thing. That it's, it's really actually hard to find the virus population that you want, uh, particularly in blood, and, but also in tissues. Um, and um, we've been involved in a series of studies. Uh, this study here has actually been, um, uh, is one of, this is a, classic um, combination study between scope and options in which we just brought the two cohorts together and we um, distributed blood and tissues to, to most of the major laboratories around the world. They said, this, is what, this is what we do for a living. This is the, 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 the Scoptions model. Um, we, 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 prov we provide this platform of scope and options to, to anyone who wants to get involved. Most people do. The reason why they do is because um, we have an extremely well-characterized group of individuals. We have an, an amazing database. And we have a culture in, in which basically this platform becomes available to everybody. And there are no walls, there are no barriers. Everyone shares data. Uh, and many groups like to work in that environment. And so what we had done in this and many other studies is simply just distributed blood around the world. They all came back. And we took a look at it. And we found that all these assays that people are doing don't correlate with each other practically at all. Um, suggesting that most of this is worthless. Um, and um, and uh, other people have taken different um, conclusions from that, but that 
at least is my perspective. Now, uh, what are we going to do? Okay, now here we come to a clinical trial that we're about to start. All right. So here is a, um, um, here are the, 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 the greatest hits of Cure Research, right? These patients that you've heard about before, the, the first, this is the people who stop, inter, stop antiretroviral therapy. Your typical person who stops antiretroviral therapy, virus rebounds in about two weeks. Maybe if they start really early, it will be three to four weeks. But then the Mississippi baby took, um, took a couple years. Uh, the Boston patients who had a bone marrow transplant also took several months. Um, and then P Mr. Timothy Brown, basically, is, he's going out eight, nine years now. And what you can tell from these types of stories is that the amount of virus that people have at the time they interrupt therapy appears to be a reasonable predictor of what happens later on. And this has set up the model uh, in which we believe that the best way to discover a biomarker that will, predict, will tell us what we need to know about a person's reservoir is to interrupt therapy, monitor how long it takes for the virus to rebound, and then go back and see if there's anything at the baseline that can predict what happened. If we can do that, if we can find something that will predict very carefully how long it takes someone to rebound, then that becomes more or less the viral load of the cure world, because then we just want to reduce that. And that's a lot easier to do. So if we have a target, um, and we know what we actually, what we, what we want to measure, and we just look, and then we start doing study after study to see if we can reduce it. And, and the clinical trials become easier. And to be honest, industry, all those companies that jumped into the HIV game back in the 90s, they jumped in the game because of viral load testing. There was a biomarker that allowed them to develop drugs very quickly. If we had a biomarker of the reservoir, these companies would also jump into this game um, and good things would happen as a consequence. So what we are going to do with the participation of, uh, of, of the clinicians and their patients in this room is a, uh, and with the support of the AMFAR Institute, um, we're going to do a prospective study where we bring people in. Um, characterize their lymph nodes, their guts, their, uh, everything we know about them, ask them to stop therapy, come in two to three times a week, and we'll send nurses to wherever they are if they can't come in, and we'll draw blood in real time, and the minute the virus comes up, we will call them back and get them back on therapy. Okay, we've done this now already in other settings, and what happens when you do this um, is that people only have a viral load that's, that's replicating for a couple days, actually, three to five days at most. And the viral load will go from undetectable, usually up to around several thousand. We put people on therapy immediately. Um, we inform them about safe sex, and, and, and we're thinking of offering PrEP to their partners. Um, but if you do this correctly, the CD, the, and this was done by a group in Minneapolis on the left, right, they, where they showed in 10 or 12 people that did this, the virus came up, boom, they slammed them. The CD4 counts didn't budge, didn't hit. Their CD4s were stable. There was no, no change in the inflammatory biomarkers. It's only a few days of viremia. So there is clearly some safety issues here, but we think we have mitigated that to the degree that we can by putting people on therapy. And then the, but if we can pull this off, then we will have an incredibly rich database that will allow us to do what we've done before, to just distribute the samples to everyone in the world to try to figure out how best uh, to, to measure the reservoir in the future. And this study uh, will be starting enrollment. We just got, we had no problem getting all the various regulatory approvals. It's now fully approved, and uh, we should be up and going soon, and you may hear, hear about this. Um, this is a study done by the Scoptions team where we looked at the nature of the virus in the blood and the virus in the lymph nodes. They were quite different. Um, and um, and uh, it has it, it became the inspiration for another series of studies that we're doing here that Tim Hendricks is le leading and his group. And um, on the left is some studies where they actually took antibodies to HIV, they poured into the vein of a monkey that was infected with SIV, and they were able to show where the virus lit up. Okay. So that's an imaging study. And so uh, with AMFAR Institute and their support, Tim's group is going to be looking at, at BRCO1, which is an antibody 
that targets HIV, going to label it, it's quite safe, put it into a person's um, bloodstream, and then monitor to see where it lands, and that will allow us to get a sense of how much virus exists in the brain, in the testes, in the spleen, and so forth. Um, and he's got now all the regulatory approval, and that study should start rolling quite soon. In a couple of years, uh, other companies like Merck in particular are developing really specific markers that we can do this with beyond the antibodies. So we have a robust plan here in San Francisco to try to come up with usable ways to monitor the, bio, the, the reservoir in blood, in tissues, and with imaging. Um, when is the, the reservoir established? Um, this is a critical point. This is a beautiful work that was done by uh, the, the Thai and the, um, by the military groups in Thailand and East Africa. And I, I just show this because I wanted you guys to know um, just what, ha what happens during the first couple weeks of infection. So just pay attention to the top blue line. Um, this is um, the amount of HIV DNA that exists in cells uh, in untreated infection. And what happens in the first, um, these are, these are uh, people who were followed very carefully, HIV negative. I think this is, I think this is mainly the Thai cohort. HIV negative people in Thailand um, at risk getting serial uh, checks and then they became infected. Um, actually, this is the group in East Africa. So they were being followed very carefully. They became infected. Uh, and they were able to show over a period of two weeks. So as soon as the virus became detectable in the blood, over the next two weeks, so this is really the first two weeks of infection that we can detect, there was a 100 to 1,000 fold increase in the size of the reservoir. And this was permanent. So this is, um, and that's when it's established. So that's, that has posed problems because it is hard to find people in the first two weeks. Most people, they're not antibody negative. They're not even sick, right? It's usually about two weeks later, they, be, they serial convert, they develop symptoms. Um, and so um, by the time people actually figure out what's happening, it's game over. The, the reservoir is more or less established. Um, but the RAPID program, um, a, lot of you, a lot of people in this room are involved in the, in the RAPID program and getting to zero, and, and this massive effort, this community-based effort in San Francisco to get everybody on therapy as soon as possible has led to lots of testing, lots of prep use, and has led to us to, that, that, to, to be able to bring this entire rapid community-based infrastructure um, to identify individuals who are really just becoming infected. In fact, we have a couple people who are going on PrEP, HIV negative one day, started PrEP the next day, turned out they were just turning positive. We learned about that very quickly. We put them on therapy. So we have now a, a cohort um, that's being run through the options cohort with scope involvement of people who are actually being treated super early. And Hiroyo Otano actually has a couple people that you'll hear about probably over the summer um, who, um, who, who basically got um, treated as early as theoretically possible. It's almost impossible to treat a human being as early as these, these guys were treated. Um, and they, we've done extensive assessments of the reservoir and we can't find anything. So it's, we're, we're hoping maybe perhaps it'll be possible to cure HIV infection with every therapy. Stay tuned. Um, but more importantly, really key point, early antiretroviral therapy, even if it doesn't cure you, the reservoir size is really small. And there has not been, a, a, an, op, there's not been uh, an ability for the immune system to cause mutations, basically drug resistance, because if you wait too long to treat someone, the immune system selects for these resistant mutations to the immune system that get deposited in the reservoir, and, and the immune system no longer works. Um, and there's also this um, story from the Visconti cohort that if you start therapy early, although not too early, complicated reasons, the immune system actually um, gets primed by the virus, but does not get destroyed by the virus. So treatment of acute infection in the cure world is absolutely critical because it does, because it might prove curative. We'll see. If not, the reservoir size is so small that immunotherapy might work. Um, and early therapy will prevent the development of escape resistance, so the immune system will continue to work. 
and the immune system is preserved. So this is partly why we're really interested in getting as many people as we can um, on therapy as early as possible. Of course, this concept was invented here by the options team, and they've been doing this um, for well over, I think, 10, 15 years now. Um, so uh, this is the early therapy stuff. All right, so let me shift gears and, um, and explain to you how we are going to take this knowledge, these stories, our knowledge of the stability of the reservoir, its distribution, its mechanisms for why it exists, and our evolving capacity to measure it, how we're going to take that knowledge base literally starting like this month over the next several years uh, to come up here in San Francisco with what I think is probably one of the more viable ways to achieve a regimen that can actually achieve what we want to do, which is long-term remission. Okay? We have constructed a rather con convoluted, complex family of studies, which are all linked, which we think, um, and I gotta admit, others are thinking the same now. Uh, this model is being, um, that we've built together is being also put together by other groups, particularly North Carolina and Boston. Um, and it's, it's the following. First, we, um, our approach is inspired by all the knowledge I just, I just outlined, but also inspired by, and I've mentioned this in previous talks here, the ongoing revolution that's happening in cancer immunotherapy and um, um, uh, with regard to these uh, immunotherapeutic interventions that are having a huge impact on multiple cancers. Although very importantly, um, in the mo almost all these cancers, these drugs do wonderful things for about 20% of people, but not so much for everybody else, and I'm trying to figure out why that is. Um, but the cancer paradigm is the same as the HIV one. So the cancer paradigm in terms of immunotherapy is based on the concept that you have these cancer cells that exist in tissues that are hard to reach. They're rare cells, but they're foreign just like HIV-infected cells, they stimulate within that environment a local inflammatory environment because they are foreign and the immune system wants to get rid of it. But either by luck or something that cancer does, in the setting of this inflammatory environment, it sets off a massive counter-regulatory immunosuppressive environment that turns everything off. So even though the cancer is thought to be inflammatory, if you don't get rid of something with an inflammatory response quickly, then you have chronic inflammation, which is very harmful, and you have a whole series of pathways, many of which are now being studied here in the DEM, that get turned on to splunt this inflammatory pathway, and this prevents the immune system from working. Okay? That is the conceptual model that exists in, in cancer, and to be honest, it's the conceptual model that sort of has been at the heart and soul of, of much of the work that, that our groups have been doing, um, including Peter's group. And this is Peter's um, famous slide where he looked at the amount of T cell activation in untreated infection, treated infection, and HIV negatives, and showed that untreated infection has lots and lots and lots of T cell activation. For people on therapy, it goes way down but does not normalize um, as compared to HIV negatives, and that persistent dysfunction activation of the, implant, of the adaptive immune system is probably contributing, we think, to the inability of the immune system to clear the reservoir. So, that, um, so that's, that's sort of our perspective, that that's a fundamental problem as to why the immune system's not working well and we gotta fix it. Now, we have not been, um, we're not the first people to try to do this. There have been two decades of largely failed approaches in which people have tried to bring together various immunotherapies, vaccines, anti-inflammatory drugs, vaccine adjuvants, and try to figure out whether or not we can rebuild the immune system so people can stop therapy. They have essentially, I mean, dozens and dozens of these studies. And some of them, if you, if, you know, if you squint, um, have a glass of wine, uh, maybe more, you can sense that maybe there was some benefit there, but, but for the most part, these have all failed. And they failed because of these reasons. We know why they failed. And we think we know how they fix it. So here is our 
groups approach. We are going to do five things, and they're all launching. And we think that a combination of these will be, able, will be necessary to achieve our goal. First, we need better vaccines. And the best vaccine out there, in my mind, is a vaccine that was developed by Lewis Picker. And this is, um, this is the central thing that we're doing in the Derrick Laboratory, uh, which is a $25 million grant that Lewis and I and others have. What Lewis has shown is that if you take CMV and you reconstruct it, take genes out, put genes in, and, um, and add HIV or SIV proteins that you can turn CMV into a machine that can really dramatically turn on the immune system to attack HIV or SIV. And he's shown in monkeys that in about a half of monkeys who are vaccinated become infected, the vaccine-associated immune response cures those monkeys. Okay, so this, and there's some caveats there that are important, but I don't have time to go into, but, the, but bottom line is, Based on these observations, we think that the CMV vaccine is the one that is best able to generate the types of T cells that we need, cells that could actually be potentially curative. Probably not this year or next year, but I'm thinking in 2019, when we do some, after we do a fair amount of safety studies uh, in HIV negatives, uh, we, will be, we will do here the first therapeutic studies of these vaccines. It'll be done here in San Francisco General. Um, we're gonna take people who are um, um, treated, uh, CD4 count above 350, and we'll do a, kind of like a cancer model, um, dose escalation, small doses, uh, uh, look for toxicity. If there's no toxicity, increase in groups of three and so forth. To, to come up with a dose that we think is immunogenic and then safe, and then we'll do a second study to see whether over a long period of times that immunogenicity can actually have an impact on the reservoir size. These studies will likely take um, two to three years to get in the clinic, and then two to three years. But this is going to be, I think, a pretty high profile study. Everybody's quite interested in this approach, given what's happening in the monkeys. In the meantime, um, we are working now with a company called Inovio. Uh, Inovio is having a, a huge impact in the, in the vaccine world. They have a, an approach where they take fragments of DNA, and they've shown that you can actually generate massive responses to Zika virus, Ebola virus, and in this study, um, using just DNA and a proprietary way to deliver it, HIV DNA, or this is um, uh, HPV DNA. In this study, which, which I think is the best therapeutic clinical trial I've seen out there in chronic infectious disease um, or in cancer, uh, they randomized about 150 women who have early pre-malignant pre cervical lesions, and they were randomized to get this vaccine or not, and the group that got vaccines they generate these very powerful CDT cells. They went to where they needed to go, which is this inflammatory environment where the, where the cervical cancer is brewing, and they got rid of the cells. Um, and they did it in a way that was not subtle. So uh, it proved to me that it um, has some solid clinical endpoints that this DNA vaccine has the capacity to generate powerful CDT cells, which have the capacity to go to tissues and have the capacity to kill disease cells. Exactly what we need. So Rachel, um, who's working with um, primarily in, um, you guys know Rachel, she's in the clinic, but she's also primarily lab-based. She more or less um, um, led a effort for which I took all the credit <laughs> to get, um, welcome to academics. <laughs> um, and uh, she, um, uh, we got a big grant, millions of dollars, uh, to study this approach. And this is going to be a very straightforward study um, because this is benign. I mean, I mean the, the, you do an injection, a little bit of electric shock to, to make it work better, but it's, people get used to it, um, <laughs> I'm told. Um, but, uh, and, um, and uh, we're going to look to see whether or not that this approach can generate these big, massive T cell responses that we think are needed. Uh, these studies are going to start, um, they have to start this year. There's not going to be any treatment interruptions, um, and we hope to, to, to enroll this study pretty quickly. Okay, that's vaccines. Vaccines are not going to work by itself. This is a, 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 nature, a nature study by, the, by our friends, colleagues, and competition in Boston. 
the Harvard group, who are getting into this game in a big way. And what they showed in a very nice monkey model is that if you gave a vaccine to treated monkeys, not much happened. If you gave a, a, um, a, the vaccine with an adjuvant that makes the vaccine better, uh, the reservoir size went down and a, and, and a few of the monkeys actually appeared to achieve long-term remission. The adjuvant that was used in this study is, uh, is, is being developed by Gilead. Gilead has developed uh, something that there's a lot of buzz about. It's called GS9620. It turns on TLR7. TLR7 turns on the immune system and makes vaccines more effective. Um, uh, based on these types of data, AMFAR uh, gave Paul Volverding and, and, and our team, which is now includes Peter, $25 million dollars mainly to develop over the next three to five years uh, these various different adjuvants, TLR4, TLR7, TLR8, TLR9, which are designed primarily to make the immune system work better, to make vaccines work better. Um, they also will hopefully cause the virus to come out of its hiding place. Um, and um, we are going to do a study that's, that's, for us, the most important study we're doing this year. Uh, we're start, this just got approved by the IRB. We're going to take um, people who have controlled virus in the past. So if you know anyone who's controlled virus in the past, not too high, um, who presumably have T cells at work, we're gonna, but they're now on treatment, we're going to give them this magic potion, which will make those T cells we think work better, and so that they can stop therapy and become elite controllers. Um, and you'll hopefully hear more about that from the members of the SCOPE team uh, as we get up and going. Uh, the study here does involve a treatment eruption, so it, it will require a fair amount of close monitoring and, and highly educated, highly engaged uh, patients. Um, we also got funding to look at a TLR9 agonist that will probably start later this year, uh, no, and also associated with a um, uh, uh, a treatment eruption. We're doing this in collaboration with a group in Europe and Rockefeller and Melbourne. Um, I need to say that, uh, that this, our group didn't do this, but Diane, Diane Havelier, who's been working with Steve Yuko and Joe Wong for a long time, um, have a really high profile paper recently in Nature Medicine where they showed that a, a retinoic vitamin A type stuff actually has this amazing capacity to, to reverse latency, shock, but also induce many of the innate immune functions that we think TLRs work that can actually lead to um, uh, cell death. So they, have a, they are also considering, and we'll work with them, presumably, of a study of a retinoic acid derivative that can actually, um, that's FDA approved, that they think might be able to reverse latency and enhance the capacity of the cells that harbor the virus to die by apoptosis. Um, all right, so checkpoint blockade. Uh, Jackie Wang, who's an oncologist, has, been, um, has become one of the experts on trying to use the HIV-infected population of people with cancer to um, determine whether or not these various cancer immunotherapeutics, particularly those that block PD-1 or CTLA-4, are safe in HIV and have a potential effect on the reservoir. These are cancer studies. Um, and um, Jackie is recruiting these people pretty carefully now. So if you have people with cancer and HIV, almost any cancer will make them eligible. They can access for the first time, because they've always been excluded by these studies, they can ac access this family of these new drugs which are um, causing all this bud in oncology, and we'll see whether or not they're safe and effective with the cancer. And our group will actually, in the background, using whatever blood we can get, ask the questions of whether or not we can actually have, have an impact on the reservoir size. Uh, Anti-inflammation. Um, our group um, has been doing lots and lots of work over the past several years trying to block this chronic inflammatory pathway Probably the biggest study we're doing now is with Priscilla Shu, who's uh, looking at canakinanab. She's got 30 or so people from our clinic now on this drug. Uh, it's safe. It blocks IL-1 beta, which is one of the primordial stimulators of the immune system. Um, and the question here is whether blocking this pathway will reduce in lower cardiovascular disease, lower inflammation, 
and Rachel and others will look to see whether or not it enhances T cell function. Uh, Tim Hendrick is doing a similar thing with serolimus mTOR inhibitors uh, in the ACTG, and these studies, um, this study is actually almost fully enrolled. Um, and this is just a series of the studies that our group is doing um, either here or, or within the ACTG to block these various different pathways. All right. Um, last thing. So we used to think, I used to think this was it. That's all you need to do. Make T cells better, get rid of the inflammation, give them an adjuvant or two, and you're done. But it's... A lot of things has happened in the past year suggesting that this is probably not going to happen in a typical person who's got a million infected viruses in their body. The immune system tends to do well with, the, with, the, with HIV, but only when the reservoir size is quite small. And so this comes up to the last thing that our group has never really focused in on, but will do so more in the future, is this concept of shock and kill. Shock and kill is, is something you guys have heard about before. You blast the virus, the latent reservoir, out of its hiding place, um, and then the cell that makes the virus will die off with our help or by itself, and the amount of virus in the body goes down. Um, and, um, and this approach, the initial series of shock and kill approaches were all about getting rid of all the virus and curing people, but no one thinks that's feasible anymore. So what this is all about these days is just reducing the reservoir to the level where the immune system can take over. Um, our group and others have done multiple studies. Uh, Sugi Lee led one here um, uh, looking at disulfiram. The results have been underwhelming. Um, drugs are safe, you can reverse latency, but you haven't had any huge impact on the reservoir. The most promising drugs to do this are things that block PKC, um, prostatin, bryostatin. Turns out these drugs are quite toxic. So in a story that I think is fun, it's my last clinical trial, but Sugi, um, I don't know if she's in the room, but uh, she's working with, um, with uh, Mattia Peterlin, who's a very bright basic virologist, and they've come up with the discovery that the most powerful shock drugs, these PKC agonists, um, are when you make them as pure drugs, they're really toxic. But a bunch of these, they're called inginals, exist in a lot of weeds around the world. Um, and apparently, you can go to Golden Gate Park, and if you know what you're doing, you can find some of these weeds that are packed with these inginals. Um, if you take a lot of this stuff, it makes you sick. Um, but this Kansui, Kansui is one particular um, species that's common in China. It has been used for long periods of time, for min, min, thousands of years in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, for the treatment of ascites, liver cancer, and so forth. Um, and what we now know is that, it, that if you, when you swallow it, it does cause an inflammatory response um, uh, that um, makes people uncomfortable, but apparently it doesn't cause any major issues. Um, and so we are working with uh, the FDA, who, who, have, who are supporting the study, because they like rigorous assessments of traditional medicines, not done often. We're going to do a rigorous assessment of a traditional medicine with all the bells and whistles, PK, PD, and safety. Um, but we're going to actually be able to show, do for the first time a study of a, of a very powerful shock agent. Uh, this study will happen here, probably at the end of the year, uh, and we're also working with a group in Utah. Um, and perhaps we will have a bigger program uh, of these types of interventions. But the goal here is to shock the virus out, because we are developing all these other drugs that will kill the virus once it's out. Um, and, and we think that will be an essential component to the UCSF strategy of trying to come up with a remission, which of course is going to be, um, is going to require multiple different uh, approaches at the same time. One last comment, okay? I know a lot of people in this room work in an international setting, um, and it's hard to imagine all this mumbo jumbo having an impact globally. And the Gates Foundation has, um, has gotten involved in cure research, then got out of it, and they got back involved in it. You know, the Gates Foundation is all about having an impact uh, on a global level. 
uh, with regard to HIV. They are now sort of back into it. They, they, they sponsored a study that, that I participated in with, um, with Andrew Phillips using a, um, a database from Zimbabwe and asked the question, what does a cure have to look like in order for it to be able to improve on what's happening on the ground now with antiretroviral drugs? Um, and we went through all the various different logistical issues, safety, and so forth. And essentially what this cure has to look like, it should be something we presume is going to take people who are on therapy. All these things require people on therapy first, who have a reasonable CD4 count above 350. But that's it. Any gender, any CD4 nadir, any age, it's got to work in everybody. Um, it can be parental or oral. Typically, we, one expects that it has to be delivered over a finite period of time, perhaps six months, but not necessarily something that requires tertiary care. Okay. Um, and it has to achieve, it has to build up the immune system to a degree that when people stop therapy, their risk of rebounding is comparable to what is happening in the world treatment. In the world treatment, most people don't rebound, um, although, although there are stockouts and there are missed doses and there's, you know, here yesterday and I can't put the number of people lost their insurance on January 1, and so we're dealing with all these people who had stopped, stopped drugs in San Francisco. So all those types of issues. So if you, so there's, treatment is great when you take it, um, and perhaps a durable remission, you won't have to deal with all that nonsense, but it has to achieve something comparable to antiretroviral therapy, and you have to do it for something that's not that expensive. The point at which it becomes cost saving, I think, is about $1,400 for a package. Um, I think that the, the, what we outlined with, um, with vaccines and with immunotherapies, some of which I think are easier than others, that I think that we could actually deliver such a package. Um, obviously, it would cost a lot more locally, uh, and so I think we're, we're right on target to achieving what, what the Gates Foundation thinks might be necessary. Um, and with that, uh, these are the key people from DARE uh, and the AMPAR Institute. Um, uh, and uh, we need to update some of the pictures here of the Scoption team, but um, um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, but I, I, I kind of have a sense. <laughs> it's a little too out there for <laughs> any real questions. Well, in elite control, yeah, yeah. In elite controllers, um, the virus that you see in blood is clonal, archival, not particularly interesting. The virus you see in the nodes is active, replicating, diverse. So the nodes, an elite controller, you know, you look at elite controller, they have very little virus in their blood, and basically it's this ancient stuff that probably doesn't do much. All the action is in the tissues, and it doesn't leave. So this is why you know Peter Hunt and Priscilla Shu have these papers that have shown that elite controllers have a lot of inflammation, they have heart disease, they, have their, they lose their T cells. That's because there's actually a fair amount of disease, we think, in the nodes, but not in the blood. So that disconnect is quite dramatic. The blood's not telling us what's happening. 